Where we left off last week, Mordecai had just finished sending out his new decree, right? The, the big reversal happened. Haman was thrown onto the gallows, and Mordecai was given the ability to now make the new edict, and he did so, and the new edict looked sort of shockingly like the original edict, just with a few little swaps of people, right? Didn't look a lot like self-defense, looked a little bit more like vengeance and retribution. Chapter 8, verse 11 from last week said, He sent letters saying that the king allowed the Jews, who were in every city, to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. And it left me wondering, how many women and children are they expecting to attack them? Didn't look a lot like self-defense. Was it justifiable? Their anger was justifiable, maybe. Their frustration, maybe. Was the, the, what they were doing justice? I don't think we would call it justice by any measure of that word. Was it God-ordained? As Troy said last week, it didn't appear to have the blessing of God, the instruction of God, that we see in other similar battles in the Bible. This week, we're going to explore more of the roles that God does or doesn't play in this story. As the events unfold, the climax occurs, where is God and what is he doing or not doing in this story? Specifically, I want you to listen to how fear drives the action of the story. That's going to be a prominent theme in this week's passage. How does fear, who we're fearing, how we're responding to that fear, impact the story? Let me read just the first couple of verses here, verses, sorry, chapter 8 of Esther, verses 15 through 17, and then I'll pray for us. Esther 8.15 starts, Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king commanded his edict, the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews a feast, and a holiday. Let me pray for us. Father God, as we look at this text, as we come to your word together as a congregation, Lord, I pray that you would take over up here, Lord, that your spirit would do what only your spirit can do with your word, and that it would impress upon us what you need us to hear. That as we come this morning to a text that's just a recounting of events, Lord, that you would unfold for us your wisdom within that text, and that we would be impressed by what you are doing and by what you are not doing in this story. Father, I thank you for this sacred time together as a family. Amen. So here's Mordecai, dressed in all his royal robes. He's come out delivered, victorious. His enemy is hanging on a pike. And we're told that the city rejoices. This seems slightly strange, since this is a city most of whom he just signed a death warrant out against. Why on earth would they have been rejoicing? There, there are a couple conversations that could be had here. Some of the commentaries say, well, it was really just the Jews in Susa who were celebrating. Because the city would not have been celebrating at this point. But I'm not sure that it didn't refer to the wider population. I think they might have been celebrating. A Jewish reading of this might have looked something like, well, everybody loves Mordecai. He's the hero. And Jews rule. So why wouldn't people be cheering for us? Of course he's being celebrated. After all, he's better than that terrible Haman, at least. Realistically, though, the Jews were probably celebrating, unaware that the cause of the peril that they were recently rescued from was also the fault of the man who they're now crediting for their rescue. But the people were probably giving him the same reception that they gave Haman when Haman received his promotion. They were cheering and currying favor with the new man in charge of Hashuarius' puppet regime. What other reason might they have had to celebrate Mordecai? Well, they didn't want to be seen as opposing him, right? He just signed a warrant that said, anybody who opposes me, I can stamp out in just a few months. Given the nature of that edict, I can't imagine there were too many people booing. And then there's Haman. Where's Haman? Oh, that's right. He's hanging on a 75-foot post in his front yard. 
this does not encourage me to boo for the person who made that happen. If there's any doubt that they were cheering out of fear, that will be established shortly to come. It says also the Jews were having a feast and a holiday. As we were reading this morning in the story with the youth, we get to the place at the bottom of Mount Sinai where they make the golden calf. Moses has been gone for 10 minutes. He's not coming back. Let's make a calf. And Aaron says to them, tomorrow morning, we'll have a feast. We'll have a celebration. Let's celebrate our disobedience to God. And the Jews here, they've been rescued, so they're celebrating. There's no mention of Passover in the previous verses when we're just a day from it. But now that an edict has gone out, giving us carte blanche to do what we want to our enemies, now we're feasting. Now we're celebrating. The passage continues. I'm going to read through the whole rest of the passage we're going to do this morning, which is going to be chapter 8, verse 17, all the way through chapter 9, 19. So bear with me as it will be a little bit of a passage, and then we will come back and talk about some of those themes. Starting at the end of chapter 17, at verse 17, And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought them harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. We'll come back to specifically those five verses in just a moment. Continues on in verse 5 of chapter 9. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parshandatha and Dalphon, Aspatha, and Poratha, and Adelai, and Aridatha, and Parmashta, and Arisai, and Aridai, and Vazatha. Right? It's like reading a genealogy. It's great, isn't it? The ten sons of Haman, all specifically named, all ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, and the enemy of the Jews, but they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa the citadel was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, and also the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done to the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it pleases the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed seventy-five thousand of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and on the fourteenth day they rested, but made that day a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the thirteenth day and the fourteenth day and rested on the fifteenth day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the fourteenth day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. The events play out as expected. The Jews are given power. 
to annihilate their opposition. They kill all of the Amalekites and Agagites, right? Who up to this point, as far as we know, are 11, right? Haman and his 10 sons. So the force that was against them was annihilated. Anyone who threatened them, the families of anyone who threatened them, remember, women and children, anyone who looked at them sideways, anyone who stole their lunch money back in kindergarten, anyone who smelled funny that day, they had carte blanche to do as they with. It says they did not lay their hands on the plunder. This is an interesting passage. One of the major themes of Esther, as we read, is the, the author just doesn't tell us why stuff is going on. So we're left to fill in some of those blanks. They had every right to the, king, to the plunder based on the king's order, but they didn't touch any of it. Commentators want to assure us that it was because they didn't want this to be seen as a, a grab for wealth or prosperity. This was, this was purely self-defense. I, I think that's probably right, but if you put that in perspective, any attempt at piety amidst this unrestrained violence, hatred, and bloodlust hardly makes it sound worthy. But we didn't take any of the money. We just murdered everyone, but we didn't take any of the money. They were sated by blood and power, not wealth. And there was really no need to take the wealth because they could annihilate anyone who opposed them. Anyone who took wealth from them, anyone who prevented their business from being successful, they had an open-ended excuse to remove from the equation. And right on cue, the feckless, impotent puppet king chimes in, Esther, what else can I do for you? And now Esther's off script, right? There was a plan up to this point. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going we're gonna to make happen. And now the king comes to her and says, Esther, what else do you want? And she says, oh, man, I, I guess more of the same, right? There's, she's off script now. There's no plan. No longer is she defending the lives of her people or preserving her own life. She improvises. She employs the same values and principles that have been taught to her, that have been modeled for her. She doesn't know mercy or grace. She's been used her whole life for the ends of others. And in that moment, she repeats the only thing that she knows. I guess more of the same. Give us another day. Something like 75,000 people have died. What we could use is just a little bit more bloodshed. Disgrace the bodies of the already murdered sons of Haman. They're already dead. We've killed their entire family, but let's hang them on a pike. This, this is the great hero of this story. This is where we have to stop and read the story and think, man, there's something just not quite right about what's going on here. Ahasuerus grants her request because he doesn't care. He's the least interested character in this entire story. He might as well be the least interesting character in this entire story. He just rubber stamp stuff as it comes across his desk. Sure, it sounds good. Do that. The events end, and in chapter, in verse 17, they, they started the same way they end now with feasting and a holiday. For the second time in this short passage, the Jews sit down to celebrate. And, and I had a moment as I was reviewing my notes. How much does this sound like Haman and the king sitting down to have a drink? after they make the original edict. We're going to murder all those Jews. Let's have a drink. Now, having murdered 75,000 people, the Jews sit down to have a drink. It is becoming very difficult to distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. We know that it's not becoming difficult. It has been difficult. But for those who are reading this story as a group of heroes... It's becoming very difficult to tell which group of people we're looking at. The details and dates that, that it reviews will come into play as Purim is founded in the next passage. For now, it's sufficient to say that there was celebration. Celebration that explicitly calls for the giving of gifts to one another. But nowhere is there mention of giving of thanks or reverence to God. A celebration that nowhere gives credit for deliverance to the person who made it possible. 
The Jews who remain in voluntary exile and Mordecai have achieved victory over all who opposed them. Let me return now for just a moment to those middle five verses that I skipped. Going back to the very end of chapter 7 and the first four verses. I believe these verses reveal what's going on in the story at this time. I, I think they reveal what's motivating the people and the events. I believe they stand to show us what God wants us to learn from those events. What he intended to communicate for all time by recording those in the Bible. Those who have eyes to see and ears to hear sometimes have to have eyes to see and ears to hear what is missing as well as what is present. Before the massacre plays out, listen again to how fear drives the action. Starting back at verse 17, it says, And many of the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for the fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same month, when the king commanded the edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain their mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in the cities throughout the provinces of the king, Ahasuerus, to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all the peoples. All of the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man, Mordecai, grew more and more powerful. Verse 17 tells us the people of Persia, especially probably those in Susa, declared themselves Jews. Depending on how you're reading the story, you might consider this a win, right? After all, look at all those conversions. Their efforts not only saved the Jews, but made converts of the nation of Persia. Unfortunately, that's just not really how conversion to Judaism works. The same people who were cheering for Mordecai are the ones who said, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm a Jew for sure. Before being a Jew had been a death sentence, but now to not be a Jew carried potentially the same weight. So like the fair weather fans of our favorite sports team, they went, no, 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 I'm, I'm a Jew now, it's okay. Because the people feared the Jews. More nominal faith, more of the same faith that had been exemplified by Queen Esther and by Mordecai. Apparently you could become a Jew just by declaring yourself one. Chapter 9 says that no one could stand against them, for the fear of them, the Jews, had fallen on them. Again, no one could stand against them. No one could defend themselves. No one could even maybe confront the illegitimacy, the immorality, the evil of what was about to occur. Those aren't just the people who they were attempting to kill. Those were the good-hearted people watching what was going on around them, terrified. No one could stand against them. No one dare raise a thought in opposition. No one dare volunteer to be the next guy on the pike because the fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Verses 3 and 4 continue even more telling. All of the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, the royal agents, they all helped the Jews for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. If you doubt why they were cheering for Mordecai, listen to verse 4. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame, his reputation, had spread throughout all the provinces. For the man, Mordecai, grew more and more powerful. The officials helped. The local magistrates, the governments, the, the law enforcement, the people who would have stopped something like this insanity from happening, instead are brought on board. Why? Because they've heard of Mordecai. They've heard what happens when you stand in the way of Mordecai. His reputation preceded him. His early opponent hung on a pike in his own front yard. Haman was the prime minister, and a word from Mordecai put him on a pike. He had the king's seal in the edict that stated that he need only to point at you and declare you an enemy, and your life was forfeit, along with your wife and your children. Furthermore, the, the book of Esther has consistently referred to Mordecai as Mordecai 
the Jew. And at this point in the story, there's an interesting change, right? Now he's the man, Mordecai. He lost his title. I don't think that's a coincidence. They were afraid of him, and rightly so. In all of this, the Jews and Mordecai are victorious. No one dares oppose them. The officials and magistrates help them. Their enemies fall at their feet. The king gives them another day to satiate their bloodlust. I think this is the point in reading this story where I started to go, I have to be reading this story wrong. This version of a story where these are the heroes cannot be the right reading of this story. There, there has to be something I'm missing. The point where the absence of certain things became so glaring and spoke so loudly that it couldn't be ignored anymore. We've been discussing for a few weeks now what kind of story this is. Is it the tale of two great Jewish heroes saving the nation of Israel? Is it the tale of a God sovereignly working his will quietly behind the scenes? Or is it the tale of true human nature painfully laid open for all to see? We've reached the climax of the story now. Let's look for a moment at how the accounts of similar stories of Jewish heroism and God's sovereignty play out. Bear with me for just a moment as we look at some of those other passages. For instance, after Nebuchadnezzar has thrown Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace for refusing to worship, and they have emerged unharmed, Daniel chapter 3, 28 through 4, verse 3 says, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their house laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show you the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I challenge you to show me Christians who have made such a declaration to anyone about God. This was a pagan king. How about after Daniel emerges unharmed from the lion's den? The king Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I want you to remember those words as we close this book next week. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has sent Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Two pagan kings who know nothing of God apart from those men and their influence. Well, one more story. How about the conclusion of God's sovereignty being worked behind the scenes in Egypt at the end of Genesis? Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 and 21 say, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father has given this command before he died, his dying wish. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of God, of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. 
to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. In each of these stories, Joseph, Shadrach, and Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel are all prospered, given promotions and position. Their enemies were soundly defeated in, in reversals that, that only God could write. Joseph's brothers come and kneel down to him after making him a slave. The enemies of Daniel are thrown in the lion's den in his stead. Those who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace are burned for standing close enough to have thrown them in and die in their place. But these are not deaths that those men orchestrated. Those are not circumstances that those men orchestrated. That's where the similarities end in this story. The victories lead us to very different places. Two pagan kings, one of whom was the predecessor of the king we read about now in Esther, end up honoring God end up making broad declarations of fear towards the God of Israel. Though they may not have come to real faith in Yahweh or understanding of who he was in his covenant, they recognized his power and his providence over them. Joseph and his brothers, they expected him to exact terrible revenge for the years of slavery and exile. Instead, Joseph recognizes his place and his humility compared to God. He acknowledges God's sovereign wisdom in the actions that harmed him. He leans into God's mercy and forgiveness. And he brings actual comfort and peace to the people that he could have hated and destroyed and punished. If the writer's intention in writing Esther was to give us a story of Jewish heroism... They missed a key ingredient to that formula. The knowledge of the glory of God is nowhere to be found in our story. And I don't think this is a subtlety. I don't think this is God trying to be coy and hiding in the margins and between the lines. Make no mistake, as Troy has said, there is concurrence happening here. God is acting sovereignly for his purposes, even as the men and women of this story act for their own purposes. God acted sovereignly in the writing of this story for his purposes. But his signature is glaringly absent from the events. His signature is glaringly absent from the hearts of the people in the story. There's no repentance. There's no mercy. There's no praise to God for the deliverance received. As with the rest of the text of Esther, his name cannot be found on the lips of anyone, even at this moment of climax. There is no acknowledgement of his awesome and terrible power over all of life. The fear of God is nowhere to be found in our story. There is fear. There's fear of the king and his edicts. There's fear of Mordecai and Esther as the puppet masters pulling the strings of his regime. There's fear of Mordecai as the new despotic prime minister to replace the old one. Mordecai, who has become indistinguishable from Haman at this point in the story. There's fear of his ready sword and his gallows and the point of his finger. There's fear of the Jewish people and the angry mob that they have become. But the fear of God can be found nowhere in this story. It cannot be found in the king. He doesn't learn anything about the Jewish God like the other kings do, we read. It can't be found in Esther and Mordecai, who have no idea what to do with the power now that they've received it. And it can't be found in the Jewish people, who follow an edict that was clearly wrong. I believe this story was meant to contrast against those other stories where the main characters maintained a fear of God or learned a fear of God in the process. I believe that God intended to communicate in this passage was what happens when the fear of God has been lost. 
I believe what he intended to communicate was when we as Mordecai live without an appropriate fear of God, we're unable to fulfill his purposes. Though God may use our evil actions for good, as he does with so many throughout history, we will not be willing and active participants in the glorious unfolding of his will. Though we may prosper in his grace to all men, it will not be the kind of enduring prosperity that has blessed and inspired generations to follow us. When we as Mordecai live without an appropriate fear of God, we are unable to live lives that glorify God and point others to that same glory. Esther has no idea what it looks like to live in radical obedience to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The king has no idea who is actually in charge of this world and who's granted him the authority that he holds and who holds his life and death in his hand. When we live this way, we leave our children, our friends, our co-workers, our acquaintances, our bosses, our kings to come to faith without an example of what it looks like. To stumble through getting to know who God is without a clue what it's supposed to be. Our legacy is one of wandering in the desert instead of one of victory in God and his sovereignty over all things. Our, our celebrations and commemorations like theirs are for our perceived accomplishments and victories rather than a recognition of how God has been mightily at work in, the li- in our lives and the lives of those around the world. I'd hope to spend about half of my time in our sermon today talking about the fear of God and what that, what that looked like and what that meant and how best to apply that. But there was simply too much story to get there that quickly. So in the time that remains, I'd like to try and answer three questions for you. One is, what is the fear of God? Two is, who should fear God? And three is, what does it look like for us to fear God? Now, Troy preached an excellent sermon about the fear of God that can be found on the website if you want to go back and rewatch it. I don't begin to have time to cover what he covered this week, but that's okay because he did, and you can go check it out. But as we look at that, the first question is, what is the fear of God? The youth and I, ironically, have been spending, I don't know, the last five weeks mostly talking about the fear of God as it plays prominently in the first parts of the Bible story. I didn't do that on purpose. God providentially brought us to that conversation so we could keep having it today. Jerry Bridges calls it reverent awe, a mixture of fear, veneration, wonder, and admiration that are all directed towards God himself. John Murray, someone to whom I owe much of this week's sermon, and I'm grateful for his faithful work, calls it the soul of godliness. Scripture calls it the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. The question arose in the reading that I was doing, is it a feeling or is it an attitude? Is it a sense or is it a state of being? And the answer is both. Like love, the fear of God is both a feeling and a state of mind or an orientation of the heart. I may feel love for my spouse or my children more or less intensely at different times. But the secret to our relationship is that I choose to regard my wife with love. I choose to regard my wife with adoration. I choose to treat her with love, and I choose to live and lead sacrificially for her sake. And the beauty of it is that when I don't feel that way, That orientation of my heart guides me back to those feelings. When I wake up one morning and think, you know, I could could be a single guy. No kids, no wife. That orientation of my life and my heart and my mind and my attitude drive me back to those feelings and help create those feelings within my family so that we can all live happier lives. The fear of God is similar. There may be times when I'm overwhelmed by a sense of God's majesty and greatness and power and mercy in my life. But in the moments when I don't feel that way, in those moments when I wake up with a cold heart, 
my orientation to fearing God, my orientation to treat him with reverence and awe, and to take in his majesty and his word and in my relationship with other believers, guides me back to those feelings in a way that is helpful. It is both a feeling that God can impart upon you as he chooses and an orientation that he commands for your good. The next question was, who should fear God? Now, as I was doing reading this week, I came to the conclusion that I cannot say this better than Jonathan Edwards and John Murray. So bear with me as I read a couple quotes to you. One is from a very famous sermon by, sermon by Jonathan Edwards. It says, thus, it is that natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it, and God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is great towards them as to those who are actually suffering the executions of the fierceness of his wrath in hell. And they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate the anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold them up one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain lay hold of them and swallow them up. The fire pent up in their own hearts is struggling to break out. And they have no interest in any mediator. There is no means within which they can reach any security to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. John Murray comments that those who are subject to this wrath should not dread it, would be totally unnatural. Only the ignorant and hard-hearted could be destitute of this terror. And to suggest that the fear of God's wrath and the fear of judgments which execute his wrath is an improper motive to action is to go counter to all that sound reason would dictate. Part of the reason why I think we don't like to think about the fear of God is because for those who are unsaved, It is not a reverent awe of God. They are, like the people of Persia, afraid and with good reason. And it would do us well to remember that while that's not a doctrine that we want to think about, it is a doctrine that we must remember for the sake of those who are perishing in our lives. If you are unsaved, you have every reason to be afraid of God. Not to fear him reverently, but to be afraid of him. Murray continues, We must remember that the dread of judgment will never of itself generate within us the love of God or the hatred of sin that makes us liable to his wrath. The fear of God in which godliness consists is the fear which compels adoration and love. It is the fear which consists in awe, reverence, honor, and worship, and all of these at their highest level of exercise. It is the reflex in our consciousness of transcendent majesty and the holiness of God. The natural man has reason to be afraid of God, but the only response for those of us who are saved by him by his grace, delivered from wrath, by his providence and sacrifice, is an awe and reverence that can only be defined by the fear of God. The reflex of our consciousness to the transcendent majesty and holiness of God. If we recognize him for who he is, if we're, and what we're owing to him for what he's done for us, we can only sit back in deferential awe and lay at, the feet, lay at his feet everything that we have, and everything that we are to do with as he wills. This is what the fear of God looks like, and it is missing from the book of Esther. It's not that God is missing. The fear of God is missing. Finally, what does it look like to fear God? What does it mean for us to fear God? How would it have changed the outcome of our story? Let me appeal one more time to the eloquence and wisdom of John Murray. He says, The fear of God implies our constant consciousness that our primary relationship is to God and that all other relationships are determined by and to be interpreted in terms of our relationship to him. 
The fool says in his heart there is no God, and God is not in all the thoughts of the wicked. The first thought of the godly man in every circumstance is God's relationship to him and the circumstance, and his and the circumstance's relationship to God. That is God consciousness, and that is what the fear of God entails. As we read Esther, the story of rising and falling power, the story of hatred and revenge, God is forced into the margins and between the lines, not because this is his preference, not because this is somehow he makes his point more convincingly. The other stories in Scripture tell us that he he is the main character of our story, and he will make himself known to any man given the opportunity. He is forced to the the margins by the lack of a fear of God. It's not modeled by those who are supposed to know him, and therefore it cannot be emulated by those who don't. Fear plays prominently, but it is the fear of loss, the fear of death, the fear of man. The misplaced fear forces out the fear of God, who is the only worthy recipient of that fear and awe. If we are to live lives that overtly celebrate and point to the glory of God, if we are to live lives that model reverential awe for a glorious God for those around us, we must place the fear of God before our own eyes. We must orient our hearts to the fear of God. We must condition ourselves and our bodies and our minds to focus on and obey the commandments of God. We must remove the idols and false gods that we fear instead of him. We can't fear God and money. We can't fear God and man or the images of man on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram. We cannot fear those who would kill the body and can do no more. It's not enough to be afraid of God because of the punishment due to us for rebellion. We must place the recognition of who God is and what he has done and the fear that is the only natural response to those facts as the source and application of everything we know. It must be the filter for our reality, the the center of gravity about which we orbit and remain tethered at all times. It needs to be the driving force behind our actions. It needs to be the recognized source of all of our blessings. That is the only way for us to live out a life of fear of God and to model it for those whom we would show him to. As I pray this morning, Jeremiah 32, 39 promises us from God, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and for the good of their children after them.